Most people find the motion of a simple gyroscope or spinning top to be rather mysterious. The top seems to defy gravity. In these simulations, gravity points down in the negative z direction. If you look down the symmetry axis of the top towards the support, the top is always spinning in a counterclockwise direction. Depending on the initial conditions, the top can execute a variety of motions. Here the top is processing steadily about the z-axis near the xy plane. Let's start this simulation again, adding a trail to the center of the disk so you can see the path that it follows. We can also arrange for the top to process at an angle high above the xy plane or at an angle well below the xy plane. For some initial conditions, the top will bob up and down. This type of motion is called nutation. Here's another example of nutation at an angle high above the xy plane. We can also make the center of the disk execute loops. They can be large loops or small tight loops. What all of these motions have in common is an apparent disregard for gravity. After all, gravity is pulling down on the disk at its center of mass, so why doesn't the top fall? Let's imagine that we set the top spinning while holding on to the axle. The gravitational force is shown here as a yellow arrow. For most of us, our intuition tells us that when the axle is released, the top should fall downward in the direction of the gravitational force, down towards the negative z-axis. But that's not what happens. Rather, the top refuses to fall and instead processes around the z-axis. The procession might be steady, or the top might nutate, or it might move in loops, but the top always seems to resist the pull of gravity and avoid falling. What I want to do in this video is take the mystery away from the spinning top by examining in detail the underlying physics of gyroscopic motion. Gyroscopic motion can be explained with a simple argument based on elementary physics. Most people find this argument to be unsatisfying. The argument goes like this. A rapidly spinning top has angular momentum. By the right-hand rule, the angular momentum vector points along the symmetry axis of the top. Now, the gravitational force points down, while the force supplied by the support points up. This pair of forces creates a torque on the top. By the right-hand rule, the torque vector points in the direction shown. It's horizontal and perpendicular to the symmetry axis of the top. Now we invoke Newton's second law in angular form, which says that the net torque equals the time rate of change of angular momentum. Thus, the angular momentum must change in the direction of the torque. Like the torque, the change in angular momentum must be horizontal and perpendicular to the top's axis. The spinning top will process about the vertical direction, with the angular momentum continually changing in the direction of the torque. This argument is well known, but not very intuitive. It seems to rely on some arbitrary conventions about the directions of angular momentum and torque vectors determined by the right-hand rule. You probably wouldn't believe this argument if you had never actually seen a spinning top. We can simplify the physics of gyroscopic motion by considering a very simple top. Rather than considering a top made from a uniform disk with the mass spread throughout the disk, we can imagine the mass to be concentrated at discrete points. Here we picture the masses concentrated on 30 red spheres spread uniformly around the disk. Of course, 30 is kind of a large number, so why not just 10 spheres? Even better, how about 5 spheres? Since I want to consider the most simple possible situation, let's make a top from just two spheres. These two spheres are held together as a rigid body by the three struts shown here. I call this system the two-top. The advantage of the two-top is that we can treat the rigid body as a system of masses and struts using Lagrange multiplier methods. This allows us to determine the internal forces that hold the two masses together. I'll derive the equations of motion in detail in another video. Here you can see the simulation of the two-top with steady precession near the xy plane. We can also choose initial conditions to obtain motion with nutation, or with loops, and at various angles above and below the xy plane.
So let's take a close look at gyroscopic motion in the context of the two-top. Before we begin, we need to review some basic results from Newtonian mechanics. The first result is this. We can always treat a physical system as if all of the mass is concentrated at the center of mass and all of the external forces act at the center of mass. This is a basic result that we use so often we don't always think about it. So where does it come from? Let's say we have a collection of particles, m1, m2, and so on, with position vectors x1, x2, and so forth. Some of these particles can be grouped together to form rigid or non-rigid bodies. Newton's second law for the ith particle in the system says that the total force acting on I equals mass sub I times the acceleration of I. Here, x double dot sub I is the particle's acceleration, with the dots denoting time derivatives. Now, we can split the total force into internal and external forces. Internal forces are those forces exerted on particle I by one of the other particles in the system. External forces arise from interactions between particle I and particles outside the system. Now let's sum this equation over all of the particles. The term with the double sum vanishes by Newton's third law. Recall that Newton's third law says that the force that particle J exerts on particle I is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction to the force that I exerts on J. Therefore, in the double sum over I and J, all of the force vectors cancel in pairs. The term that remains is the sum of all external forces, which is the total external force acting on the system. Therefore, the total external force equals the sum of masses and accelerations. Next, we define the center of mass of the system as the sum of m sub i times the ith position vector, all divided by the total mass, capital M. Differentiating this definition twice, we find that the acceleration of the center of mass equals the sum of the masses and accelerations divided by the total mass. Then our result says that the total external force acting on the system equals the total mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass. This result shows that the center of mass of a system behaves like a single particle. All of the mass is concentrated at the center of mass, and the external forces are treated as if they act at the center of mass. The internal forces don't appear here. They don't have any effect on the center of mass motion. As I said before, we use this version of Newton's second law so often that we sometimes forget where it comes from, namely, from summing the individual Newton's second law equations over all particles in the system. The second basic concept that we need to discuss is the following. What exactly is a massless strut? Well, a massless strut, or rod, or beam, is an idealized structure that holds two objects at a fixed distance apart. The strut doesn't care about the orientation of the two objects, only their separation. As a key consequence, a massless strut can only exert longitudinal forces on the objects that it connects. In other words, a strut can only push or pull to maintain the separation of two objects. It cannot exert transverse forces. Let's take a close look at the object connected to one end of the strut. What you see here is a longitudinal force exerted on the object by the strut. This is allowed since such a force might be required to keep the two objects at a fixed separation. On the other hand, this is a transverse force acting on the object. A strut cannot do this, and here's why. By Newton's third law, when the strut exerts a force on the object, the object exerts an equal but opposite force on the strut. So consider the torque due to this force about a pivot point located at the second object. This torque is non-zero if the force is transverse, but the strut is massless, so it has zero moment of inertia. That would imply an infinite angular acceleration for the strut. Since this is not physically reasonable, we conclude that the strut can only exert longitudinal forces on the objects that it connects. Of course, there is no such thing as a completely massless strut but we can always imagine the mass of the strut to be negligible compared to the masses of the objects it connects. Then, to a good approximation, the forces that the strut exerts on the masses must be longitudinal. Also note that this argument doesn't really have anything to do with the way the struts are arranged. For example, we could imagine an assembly of struts welded together like this, holding the two objects at a fixed separation. 
we can apply the same argument to show that the force exerted on object 1 must lie along the line connecting object 1 and object 2. So when I say that struts can only exert longitudinal forces, what I really mean is that the forces must lie along the line that connects the two objects. Now we are ready to examine the two-top in detail to understand the forces that make gyroscopic motion possible. The two-top consists of two masses. There are three forces acting on each of these masses. One is the force due to gravity, which points down. Here the gravitational force on one of the masses is shown as a yellow arrow. The second force acting on each mass is due to the strut that keeps the two masses at a fixed separation. I'll call this strut the internal strut. The corresponding force must lie along the line between the masses. Because the two masses are rapidly rotating about their center of mass, the internal strut must exert a large centripetal force inward towards the center of mass. Here the centripetal force on one of the masses is shown as a yellow arrow. By the way, these force vectors are not drawn to scale. The internal force is typically hundreds of times larger than the gravitational force. The third force on each mass is due to the strut that keeps the mass at a fixed distance from the support. I'll call this the radial strut. Now the force on a mass due to a radial strut must be radial. That is, it must lie along the line between the mass and the support. It might not be obvious whether this force points radially inward or radially outward. In fact, as we'll see, the direction of this force alternates. Sometimes it's inward and sometimes outward. To be concrete, let's consider the motion shown in this simulation. Here the path followed by the center of mass is approximately circular and approximately in a z equal constant plane. The radial struts constrain the masses to move on the surface of an imaginary sphere. The red trails show the paths followed by the masses. The two masses follow the same shaped path, just 180 degrees out of phase. If we focus on one of the masses, we see that it rises to a sharp peak at its maximum height. At its peak, the mass is momentarily at rest, or very nearly at rest. Then the mass rotates down, and as it passes through its minimum height, it sweeps across the imaginary sphere in a path that's very nearly horizontal. So let's examine the forces that cause the mass to move along this path. Consider first the sharp peak at the maximum height. Just before it reaches this peak, the velocity is tangent to the sphere and pointing up. Just after the peak, the velocity is tangent to the sphere and pointing down. So the acceleration at the peak is down and tangent to the sphere. By Newton's second law, the total force must be in the same direction, down and tangent to the sphere. Remember, there are three forces acting on the mass. The downward force due to gravity is shown here, magnified by a factor of 20. And here's the force due to the internal strut. This force points towards the other mass. Finally, we have the force due to the radial strut. We can see from this picture that this force must be radially outward so that the sum of the three individual forces, shown in yellow, equal the total force, shown in green. The reason that the radial force is outward is that it must compensate for the large internal force as well as the small gravitational force, which are both trying to pull the mass inward into the interior of the sphere. Now let's evolve forward in time until the mass reaches its minimum height. Here it is sweeping rapidly around the sphere along a nearly horizontal path. This motion requires a large centripetal force, a force towards the center of the sphere. As you can see, this centripetal force is supplied by the radial strut. So the force from the radial strut has switched from pointing outward when the mass was at its peak and is now pointing inward. As always, the force from the internal strut points toward the other mass, and the force due to gravity is down. The individual yellow force vectors sum to the green total force vector. Let's take another look at this simulation, this time letting the camera process along with the spinning top. As you can see, the force due to the radial strut alternates between outward pointing and inward pointing as the mass alternates between a sharp peak at its maximum height and a broad sweeping motion at its minimum height. The gravitational force always points down, 
The force from the internal strut always points towards the other mass and is roughly constant in magnitude. These simulations show that Newton's second law holds for each of the masses as the two-top executes gyroscopic motion. Of course, it's no surprise that Newton's second law holds. So why does our intuition fail? Why do we intuitively expect the top to rotate downward rather than to process sideways? If you're like me, your failed intuition is caused by a misinterpretation of the summed form of Newton's second law, where all of the mass is treated as if it's concentrated at the center of mass, and the external forces are treated as if they act at the center of mass. Let's look at this closely. Define the system as the two masses and the strut that connects them, the strut that I previously called the internal strut. The forces exerted by the internal strut are now internal to this system, which is why I've been referring to them as internal forces. The external forces for this system are gravity and the forces exerted by the radial struts. Here is the two top with the forces on both masses shown as yellow arrows. At this scale, the gravitational forces are too small to see. Let's apply Newton's second law in its summed form. First, we concentrate all of the mass at the center of mass. The internal forces are irrelevant because they cancel when we add all the forces. So let's eliminate the internal forces between the masses and bring the remaining force vectors to the center of mass. Let me rescale the forces, doubling all of their lengths. So now, if you look closely, you can see the downward gravitational force acting on the center of mass. All of these forces can be added together by bringing them tip to tail. These are the forces from the two radial struts, and here is the force due to gravity. The result is the net force acting on the center of mass of the system. As the system evolves, you can see that the center of mass moves around the z-axis at a nearly constant rate in a nearly circular orbit. To obtain a perfectly circular orbit, the net force would need to be a constant vector pointed horizontally towards the z-axis. For the two-top, the net force oscillates above and below the horizontal and from one side of the z-axis to the other. This is due to the discrete nature of the two-top. On average, however, the net force is horizontal and pointed towards the z-axis, so the center of mass motion is nearly circular. So because the two-top is discrete, the net force on the center of mass is not steady, and the center of mass trajectory is not a perfect circle. But this is not really important. If the mass were spread out uniformly into a symmetric disk, like a real top, we could choose initial conditions so that the net force is steady and the center of mass orbits the z-axis in a perfect circle. The important point is this. The net force on the center of mass does not lie along the line connecting the center of mass and the support. Recall that a massless strut, or assembly of struts, that connect two masses can only exert forces along the line between the masses. So the behavior of a two-top is distinctly different from the behavior of a single mass connected to a central support. Let's call this the one-top. The difference between the one-top and the two-top has nothing to do with the way the struts are arranged. We could use a triangle of struts for the one-top and a T-shaped strut for the two-top and the conclusion would be the same. The radial strut, or struts, can only exert forces along the dashed lines connecting the physical masses with the support. For the two-top, when we bring the masses and forces together at the center of mass, the configuration of masses looks like a one-top, but the pattern of forces is quite different. Now, our intuition for the one-top tells us, correctly, that the mass should fall downward toward the negative z-axis. This is because a radial force cannot counteract gravity. In particular, the mass can't stay stationary because that would require an upward force that exactly cancels gravity. Such a force does not lie along the dashed line. Likewise, the mass can't move in a horizontal circle because that would require the total force to be horizontal. The force from the strut would need to point inward and upward. Again, such a force does not lie along the dashed line. The conclusion for the one-top is that gravity will pull it down towards the negative z-axis. The same conclusion does not hold for the two-top because the forces supplied by the struts are not restricted to lie along the line between the center of mass and the central support. So the failure of my intuition is this. When I apply Newton's second law to the center of mass of a top, 
I intuitively replaced the top with a single mass, like the one top. But I then fail to realize that the one top and the two top are governed by different physics because the patterns of forces are different. So how can we understand gyroscopic motion at an intuitive level? Here's one way to think about it. Consider the motion of the two tops shown here. The top is spinning rapidly and processing slowly. This type of gyroscopic motion is a bit different from the case we analyzed earlier. The advantage of considering the case of rapid spin and slow precession is that the center of mass moves very slowly around the circle, so the net force on the center of mass must be approximately zero. That is, the forces acting on the center of mass must be nearly balanced. Because the top is spinning rapidly, the stress in the internal strut is very large. We can split the internal forces into components tangent and perpendicular to the imaginary sphere, first for the lower mass, and now for the upper mass. The perpendicular component of the internal force pulls each mass toward the interior of the imaginary sphere, but the masses are accelerating rapidly around the sphere, which requires an inward centripetal force. Now, remember that, due to the precession of the top, the upper mass is moving more slowly around the sphere than the lower mass. In fact, the upper mass is moving just slowly enough that the internal force is larger than the required centripetal force. On the other hand, the lower mass is moving more rapidly and the internal force is smaller than the required centripetal force. So to keep the masses moving on the imaginary sphere, the radial struts must push outward on the upper mass and inward on the lower mass. Let's rescale these forces by a factor of 30 so we can see the forces that the radial struts exert on the masses. So these are the forces acting on the top from the radial struts. We can bring them to the center of mass, and as you can see, they both have an upward component. If these were the only forces acting on the top, the center of mass would move up. But they aren't the only forces. The gravitational force pulls down on the center of mass and balances the upward forces exerted by the radial struts. Let's look at the sum of the forces from the radial struts, shown in green, and the gravitational force, shown in yellow, all scaled by another factor of 10 from the previous simulation. The force from the radial struts is not steady due to the discrete nature of the two top, and as a result the center of mass will accelerate up and down as the force changes. But on average, the net force from the radial struts is just equal and opposite to the gravitational force, and the acceleration of the center of mass is zero. The small up and down motion of the center of mass is too small to see in these simulations. To be more precise, the net force from the radial struts must also have a small inward component towards the support that keeps the center of mass moving in a circle. But for the motion shown here, that force component is very small. So the key to understanding why the top doesn't fall down is to recognize that the forces from the struts are holding it up. But your intuition might also tell you that the forces from the struts should cause the top to rotate from this perspective in a counterclockwise direction. Of course, this would be correct if the masses were not accelerating, but remember, the outward force on the upper mass and the inward force on the lower mass are just what is needed to keep the masses moving on the imaginary sphere at a fixed distance from the central support. So the radial forces don't cause the top to rotate in or out of the surface of the sphere, but they do exert a net upward force on the top. This upward force balances gravity. The same type of reasoning applies when the two-top is executing steady motion above or below the xy plane. If the top is well above the xy plane, then the inward force from the lower radial strut no longer has a component in the positive z direction. But the outward force from the upper strut is even larger than before, so the sum of forces from the radial struts still has an upward component. This upward force balances gravity. Sometimes I like to imagine myself in place of the central support, holding on to the two radial struts. What forces do I exert? By Newton's third law, the force that a strut exerts on a mass is equal but opposite to the force that the mass exerts on the strut. But the struts are massless, so by Newton's second law, F equals ma, the net force on each strut must vanish. So the force that I exert on the strut must be equal but opposite to the force that the mass exerts on the strut. The conclusion is, the force I exert on a radial strut must equal the force that the radial strut exerts on the mass. To keep the top spinning and processing uniformly, I must exert an outward force on the upper strut and an inward force on the lower strut. The sum of these forces has a net upward component, which balances the weight of the top.
Of course, I don't have to hold on to the two struts separately. I can weld the struts together at the center and hold on to the single point where the struts connect. Then I only need to exert a single force on the struts, and this single force is the net upward force that just balances gravity. To be more precise, there is also a small centripetal component to the force that keeps the center of mass of the system moving in a circle. And the discrete nature of the two top means that the force fluctuates. But as long as the top is spinning rapidly and processing slowly, the force I exert is mostly up and on average equal in magnitude to the total weight of the top. So this is how the two top seems to defy gravity. The same intuitive reasoning can be applied to a symmetric top by replacing the two masses with a uniform disk. The radial forces must be outward at the top of the disk and inward at the bottom. This keeps the rim of the disk moving on the surface of the imaginary sphere. The net upward force from the struts, or axis, balances the downward force due to gravity. The same type of reasoning can also be applied to cases of non-steady motion, such as nutation or loops, and to different angles above or below the xy plane. I'll leave it to you to think through the details. In my next video, I'll derive the equations of motion for the two top using Lagrange multiplier methods. The simulations used in this video were created using those equations. The Python code is freely available at glowscript.org. I'll put a link below. You're welcome to make a copy of the code and create your own simulations. As always, thanks for watching.